Hello and welcome to the Car Care Night Reviews channel and welcome to the Honda Accord in its latest iteration. In today's video, we're gonna do a proper technical review. We're gonna look under the hood, especially the hybrid system, which is very unique on Hondas. We're gonna take a look underneath it. We're gonna take a look at the inside, the outside, and we're gonna share some things you didn't know about this generation Honda Accord and everything in between right after this. Let's start our technical review under the hood, starting with the engine. So there's two possible engines in the Honda Accord. There's a non-hybrid and then there's a hybrid. Let's talk briefly about the non-hybrid. It is a 1.5 liter direct injected turbocharged engine. They've used it in many other models. Pretty good engine. It is turbocharged, however, so maintenance is very important in these engines. And then it is direct injected only. But let's talk about the hybrid one because I think this is where Honda really wants to this powertrain to shine. This is a two liter four cylinder engine. It is direct injected only. It is non turbocharged, which is a great idea. In hybrids, typically we have not seen a lot of turbocharged engines, but this one is also non turbocharged. Let's talk a little bit about its mechanical construction. This is a plastic valve cover engine, just like every, basically every new engine these days. But Honda did something very interesting. The high pressure fuel pump, because this is direct injected only, does not sit directly on the valve cover. They have a little housing on the side that it sits on, and that housing happens to be aluminum, which is good. This engine does have electronic variable valve timing on the intake and on the exhaust side it does have oil controlled variable valve timing pretty interesting it does have vtec as well on the intake now the mechanical construction this is a single piece cylinder head roller rockers hydraulic lifters and the whole lot you do have a timing chain it is a single front timing cover it's pretty simple for service actually this engine is pretty simple there's a lot of room and that is really good the oil pan is a single piece, just like always with Honda. It does have that 17 millimeter drain plug that loves to strip, so make sure proper procedures are followed there. The cooling system here is pretty simple for this engine. You do have a electronic water pump that's about as complicated as this is, but it doesn't have really valves or complication. No, it's a pretty very basic cooling system, which is good. Looking around this engine, it is a very simple engine to work on, folks. This is very standard Honda engine. The exhaust is in the front, the intake is in the back. That is good for some reasons, not good for others. If you need anything with the intake manifold, it's a little tight in the back, but this engine does have EGR and a cooler. I love the location that they put it in. It's right there in front of you. Should there be any issues, it's not gonna, it's not gonna be extremely difficult to get to it all right there. Now, the biggest thing with this particular model, this is the one we're looking at here, it is a hybrid. So let's dive into the hybrid system because this is truly a unique hybrid system. And there is one very important thing with Honda on hybrids. Some manufacturers copied the likes of Toyota, basically the kings of hybrids. They were the ones that started from the beginning and they continued on. But did you know that Honda was actually first in the hybrid game, but they never kept on it. They had the integrated motor assist and then they came back to it. But this is their latest iteration. They did not copy Toyota like some manufacturers did. They came out with their own system and it actually works and it works really well to a point. We're gonna discuss it in details. So connected to the engine is an eCBT transmission, just like Toyota also calls it eCBT. Two things, it is completely different than that of Toyota. It is Honda's unique design. To me, it is a work of a genius. And the second thing is, it is not a CVT transmission at all. I wanted to clarify that before you get ideas. Let's dive into how this transmission works and it's a pretty interesting system. So this is a two motor system. One motor is the drive motor or they call it the traction motor. The second motor is a generator only. So one motor drives the car and one motor charges the battery. That is the basic premise of this system. The way it's constructed though is when things will get extremely complicated, I will try my absolute best to keep it as simple as possible. So this would make sense. This transmission has five shafts inside of it. 
That's everything there is. There is not a lot going on in this transmission, folks. The first shaft, which is the input shaft, it is connected directly to the engine and it has a gear. Then there's a second shaft called the generator shaft. That is connected to the generator motor. Now these two shafts are connected together. So every time the engine is running, you are turning the generator shaft, therefore turning the generator motor. Then there is a third little shaft that all it does is locks the final drive or the differential. And that's where your parking pole goes. So when you put it in park, it locks the transmission and the car will enroll. Then there is a shaft called the counter shaft. That shaft connected directly to the differential. Any power you apply to that little counter shaft, it will turn the wheels. Now bear with me because this is when things get extremely complicated. And the last shaft is the motor shaft or the traction motor shaft. This shaft is also connected to the final drive. So every time you apply power to it, it'll drive the wheels. But at the very top of it, it's actually connected to the input shaft, which is what's connected to the engine. But between them, there is a clutch to separate them. So this sounds extremely complicated and it's like, wait a second, how does this whole thing work? Let's dive into how it works because it is designed in a way only a genius can make it work. So this hybrid system, the way it works, it has multiple modes of operation. Let's start with the very first one so things would start to make sense. Your battery is charged, your engine is off, you put it in drive and you start rolling. Well, what's gonna happen there is the PCU, which is the, basically the inverter that controls where the power is going, where it's where, from the battery, charging the battery, driving the motor, doing what. This is the brain that controls everything. It's gonna send power to the big traction motor that is directly connected to the wheels. It's gonna start driving the car. When the battery charge drops to a certain point, well, how are we gonna drive this motor continuously? It's gonna supply power to the generator motor, which is because it's directly connected to the engine, is going to start the engine. Then the engine will take over turning the generator motor. So motors, there's, it's, motors are very important to understand how they work in hybrids. Any motor, if you apply power to it, it's going to turn. But if you turn it by hand or like mechanically turn it, it's going to generate. And that's the cool thing here. When the engine starts, it's going to start turning that generator motor, which is going to start supplying power. Now, if we're just taking off slowly, that power will be split. Some of it will go to charge the battery. Some of it will go and drive the traction motor. So now the engine is just a big generator. All it's doing is just turning a motor that is supplying power to drive the car. If demand increases, all of a sudden, you stepped on the gas and you really need to go. Well, instead of splitting that power that the generator is creating and some of it charge the battery, some of, no, everything goes to the traction motor. And here's the cool thing. This is a gasoline engine. It has a pretty high rev limit. So you can rev it up, speed up that generator motor and generate even more as needed. That is the cool thing. So when you drive, you're going to put it in drive. It's going to start in EV mode. And then all of a sudden, the engine will kick on. And you're going to hear the engine rev up, then downshift, then downshift. And it's a very smooth operation. Folks, that is all not actual shifting. So you know that. It is the genius of the system. All it's doing is it's revving the engine up to speed up the generator motor. So we would generate and keep up with the demand of the big motor that is actually driving the wheels and charging the battery as needed. But in the, while we're revving up this engine, let's give it kind of a mimicking of a shift. And they did that so well. You drive it, there's no shift, there's nothing. The engine is not even driving the car, but it's mimicking shifting so you wouldn't feel like it's just droning up. That is the very impressive part. Now here's what happens as you start driving and as we kind of get up to higher speeds. I tried to get an exact number. Don't quote me on this, but for from, from my research is around 62 miles an hour is when the engine can actually take over the driving part. 
Because the way these shafts are orientated and the ratios, they cannot have this engine drive at low speed because it's such a high ratio, basically an overdrive. I hope this part makes sense because that's the complicated part of this. So when you get to higher speeds, the clutch that we talked about engages and things change. The engine now is directly connected to the wheels and it's directly connected to the traction motor, which is a much larger motor. The generator motor that is always connected to the engine goes on standby. It does nothing. It's just freewheeling. We're not taking power from it. We're not supplying power. We're not doing anything with it because now the engine is turning the much larger traction motor, which that now starts to generate, charge the battery, and the engine actually drives the car. That is the only time the engine will actually take over the driving part. This sounds extremely complicated. And you know what? It is on the design board of the geniuses that did this from Honda. Because when you look at the components of this transmission, there's actually not much going on. There's five shafts, there's two motors, and a clutch. And by the way, the clutch is a hydraulic clutch with a little valve body. It just has one solenoid, engage, disengage. That's it. There's nothing else in this transmission. You take this transmission, tear it apart, put it next to any simple four-speed automatic transmission. The automatic transmission, the regular standard torque converter one, will seem like it is mega complicated compared to this, let alone a belt or steel belt CVT. This is not a CVT transmission, folks. The reason they say it's a continuously variable transmission is because the motor can vary the ratio and speed up, slow down. The motor can spin really fast. And that's how you are able to propel this car. This is such a cool system. My hat goes off to the designers of this and how refined it is. This is the biggest thing about the system. It is ultra refined. I mean, the mimicking of the engine it will fool you for a second thinking that it is actually shifting it. Oh, this has a six speed transmission because the engine is revving up and then it comes down. It 100% mimics a regular torque converter automatic transmission. It doesn't drone up or sometimes you'll get like ECVT, especially from Toyota, we have to say that. They'll mimic a shifting, but it just feels so just unnatural and strange. This does it so much better, but in reality, it's not doing anything. It's not even driving the car. I hope that makes sense, how genius they were able to do this. Now, the main rival of this system is Toyota hybrids. Of course, Toyota is the one that stuck on to hybrids and went on. Here is the advantages and disadvantages of this system when compared to the Toyota system. I think the biggest advantage is how smooth it is and how it makes you feel when you drive it. You drive this, I mean, if, you, if I don't tell you this is a hybrid, you just get in it, apart from the engine all of a sudden starting in the middle of your drive, it feels like a normal car. It takes off, it shifts. That's the average Joe that is not into cars. That's the feeling they will get. It is very refined. It does not have the CVT drone that you find in, in Toyota hybrids. It is not very loud. This engine is very well insulated. And the transmission is also quiet. You don't have the whining noises that are typical with Toyota hybrids when they regenerate and everything. This doesn't have, the, it's very refined. Now the main disadvantage is this. This transmission, even though it is very simple, it does have more stuff. And the biggest thing is it does have a clutch that wears. It is not going to wear at the rate of any other automatic transmission, but still, when we're putting head to head, the Toyota transmission, the ECBT, is one of the most reliable transmissions because there's nothing. There's just two motors and a bunch of shafts that sit in a little planetary gear set. They're all mechanical parts. There's no clutches, no fragile valve body and hydraulics. There's nothing. Here, you have a very small hydraulic circuit for one clutch, which is... By the way, in there, I have to mention this because the truth has to be said. This transmission in, in the simplicity and potentially the reliability aspect is leaps and bounds ahead of any automatic transmission and of course any CVT transmission. It is that good. And the best part about it is I think the complication was in the design. And the last time I actually said these exact words about a system because the design was so complicated, but they did it so well that the final result doesn't look complicated at all when you look at it as a physical part. 
was the Tesla Model Y that we reviewed with the thermal management system. They spent so much time designing it and really doing things to the next level that the final product looked like a tiny little component, but it's so well engineered internally that it works and works very well. Same thing here. My hat goes off to her to Honda for designing the system to begin with and now improving it. Now the improvements that happened here had to do with size. They moved the where the two motors were inside the transmission to make it more compact. And that is the huge deal actually because the things are not very cramped here. And that is one of the things about the previous generation hybrids from Honda. Think the transmission was huge. This is much smaller and really good. Now let's talk about some of the other things that it has. It does have a separate cooling system for the mainly for the inverter and the motor as well. It just cools them. There's nothing really special about that. Now the battery is a lithium ion battery in the cord that sit underneath the seat, which is a very important place, it's a very good place compared to the CRV 2023 CRV that we reviewed. This is a much better space. The only Thing that I have to say that I wish they would have done. See, in the 2023 CRV, they added a second gear. So instead of that one clutch that engages the engine directly to the to the final drive on an overdrive, they added another little gear that also has a clutch, and you could drive the car at lower speeds. Not 100% like the ECVT from Toyota, but it was a lot better and it gave you actual engine drive at lower speeds. They did that in the CRV for towing capacity to give it some towing ability. They didn't do that here. I wish they would have done it here. It would have been even better, but they didn't. But still, the system is truly impressive. There's a very last important bit that we got to talk about. The hybrid battery is air cooled and it sits underneath the back seat and there is a vent in the middle of the floor area of the back seat. Unfortunately, they did not add a filter for it. A mistake that Toyota initially did with their hybrids and they fixed later. Because when you that fan gets clogged with lint, with dog hair, with your life getting inside of it basically, you will have issues with cooling. And these batteries, when you overheat them, Fortunately, that is over for the battery. So you want to be a little bit proactive about keeping that vent from blocks, from everything. And we're going to talk a little bit about this, but at least in their defense, I will say this, they put the vent in the middle. They didn't put it to the sides. They didn't put it in the back of the seat. They put it right in the middle. That's actually the least used area of the back seat, which is very good. Let's take a look underneath the Honda Accord. First thing is, everything is covered up. This is something that all manufacturers are now doing. The interesting thing here is, this is actually a, feels like aluminum or tin cover, and it's not all plastic. You do have, unfortunately, to remove this to do like something like an oil change. You do have a little cooling vent here. You do have your lift point here on the subframe that is exposed. But let's take a quick look at the front suspension here. Single piston caliper, of course, this has the regenerative braking being a hybrid. You do not need something bigger than that. Aluminum control arm, but the best part is the ball joint is separate. So if that ball joint ever goes out, you don't have to replace the whole control arm. We'll be pressing in and out. No, you could just replace it separate. Steel knuckle, which is pretty interesting. This is a standard McPherson setup. They did not complicate things. And Honda finally is getting away from the plastic internal sway bar links, but these are actually aluminum sway bar links. They're not the longest lasting in the world, but they're definitely better than the plastic ones they used to use. Over in the middle, exhaust quality is marginal. That's what I'm going to put it. They usually don't have the highest quality in the world, but these are better than many others. And I like how they have everything covered up all the way to the edge. So you really only have very small section exposed, and that is really nice. Interesting, the brake lines are on the fuel lines and all, all the lines that go to the back, they're all coated. And you only see them here. Everywhere else, they're pretty well hidden. You don't even see them. You see some high voltage lines. They actually run external to the battery. They don't run inside the car, which is pretty much the case with all hybrids. I just wish they would have covered this a little better. That 
they did install it in this metal pipe, but still, it's kind of low, and if you hit something here, it could damage that wire. I wish they would have tucked it up, maybe through the frame. That would have been nicer. And then we move on to the back. Fuel tank is right here. It's also covered, not with a heavy-duty cover, but it's at least covered so you won't get stuff on top of it. Let's look at the rear suspension here. Pretty interesting rear suspension, multi-link. All of them are, all the arms are steel and knuckle is aluminum. This is something, again, becoming a fashion. They're trying to save weight wherever they can. Really dislike the aluminum knuckles for service later, especially this car. We're hoping this is one that lasts a long time. Single piston caliper in the back with the integrated electronic parking brake. Pretty standard, again, in the automotive industry. Now, something Honda did here that is not the norm in the automotive industry. The muffler is here. The side of the muffler is somewhat open. It's actually covered by the muffler. But if you look on the other side, every video we do, I tell you, everybody leaves this open. You see how this is closed? This is how it should be. And really glad Honda did not just leave it wide open like everybody else. Now, one last interesting thing about this, which is similar to the previous generation, Honda actually uses an indirect TPMS system. What that means is there's actually no sensor inside the wheel. So the ABS system watches the speed of each individual wheel. When you have a low tire, the speed of that individual wheel will change, and that's how it knows. But what they did here, which was pretty cool, they can actually tell you which tire it is. Because before, I mean, I don't know why they did it didn't do it from before everybody when they, we did have we have indirect but you know which wheel is turning faster or slower than the rest well just report it on the screen and that way they, they don't show you an exact reading of the tire but that's usually irrelevant to most people they just want to know do we have a low tire or not and now you'll be able to know you have a low tire and which one and that is pretty cool. Avoids the whole mess with sensors and batteries dying and sensors corroding and breaking. Makes things very nice. Let's take a look at the outside of the Honda Accord. Starting with the very front. Doesn't look like this car. It looks exactly like that car. I have to say one thing. Usually the Accord is a car you look at and it's kind of on the nicer looking side. Let's just say this one skipped that feature. It's not that an offending look, but it's not an exciting one exactly. But let's glance past the actual looks and talk about some technical stuff. So radar sensor is right here, right behind the emblem. And then you have the camera right here for your lane keep assist and all that good stuff. They are similar, and you do have two blind spot monitor sensors in the back. They are similar to location-wise to the previous generation, but they have increased their angles. So they're able to detect more and work a lot better. And the camera is actually a better quality camera. So things work a lot better in that department. The wipers actually got something pretty interesting. So <laughs> most people will say at this point, why are we talking about wipers? They're just wipers, they wipe and that's it. But no, these are smart wipers. So here's what this does. So every once in a while, when you shut off the car, you'll notice that these wipers will come up and they'll stop right here. It's not gonna do it all the time, but occasionally it'll do that. And people will think initially, well, what's wrong with them? Why did they just pop up? And as soon as you start the car, they come back down. Well, the idea here is, which actually does work, when you bring the wiper down, you curled the surface that you're gonna wipe with up. And if you leave it always like that for time after time, day after day, and the heat, especially with heat, you actually curl the wiper inserts, the rubber part that wipes, and they no longer work. So by occasionally, intermittently, it'll lift it up, it'll change the curl to the other way, and the wipers will actually stay straight. Over-engineering, yes, but it was very simple to do it actually on the actual how things were made. They just change the program in the motor, it'll do that occasionally, but it does help extend your wiper inserts life. See, there's nothing more Honda than this. They did so much to keep your maintenance even lower, which we are very in love with and we welcome. 
Let's go back to the body. And this is where, I don't know what happened. So if you look right here, we always talk about cars, less is more. This is not less. There's this body line, which is fine, comes here and ends right here. But then there's this other one that it's not there here, then it starts, and it gets really big. And this one kind of disappears. It just gives it an interesting, uh, there's just too much going on for the sake of nothing. Just trying to look too cool. This line I do like, where the hood kind of comes down and then it stops. Then there's this other buckle that kind of carries across the body, which is good. The side profile, it definitely does not mimic any accord. It actually, especially in the front angle, it does mimic that same car we talked about. But again, back to the technical stuff. There's only lock unlock in the front with your kind of intelligent key. The backs are not something to be expected in this car segment. But one super cool feature that I really like, auto lock. So you have your key in your pocket, you close the door, you forgot to lock it, you walk away. It's a feature you can turn on. As soon as it picks up that you're outside the proximity of the car, it'll actually automatically lock the door. And when that feature is on, it's actually going to remind you that it's on by beeping as soon as you close the door. When you start walking away, you'll hear it lock. That is a pretty cool feature. Now something else that, that they did here. In the hybrid models only, so not in the base model or the EX, for some reason, one antenna was not enough. Usually this is where the antennas are, are at in newer cars, which is not body color for some reason. They decided that this antenna alone was not enough. So there's actually a second antenna built into the outer perimeter of the rear glass. This is actually how they used to do antennas before the shark fin became a thing. But the Honda Accord, only in the hybrid trim, so not the EX, not the base model, has a second antenna here for excellent reception. I still don't really get why we needed that, but they did. Let's look at the back here. And again, there is, it's just, I like the bar light, I like everything, but something just feels off. I feel like they went too, I'm just gonna say it, it looks nothing like it. They went to Audi A7 with that slope back, the trunk's kinda going this way. It didn't work out very well. This is not the best looking Accord there ever is. And they are not exactly exciting cars, the other models, but usually they've looked better. This one, takes you a minute to get used to how they look. Like the bar tail light, but just, and one thing I do like, they do have a little bit of a bumper. Usually this is kind of disappearing from newer cars. This one does have a little bit of a bumper. It's not massive, but it's something better than nothing. Now, one quote before we get into the trunk. There is not, not two words in the planet that contradict each other like these two. Hybrid, sport. Unless you get into some really exotic cars, these two words are exact opposites. But that's okay. I like that they put the sport in black so you won't notice it as much. Let's open the trunk. Pretty decent sized trunk. The cord always had a really decent sized trunk. It is however missing one little thing. There's no spare tire. And that's, uh, you got the little uh, fix and go kit. So unfortunately the cord lost its spare tire. That's something that's becoming kind of the norm in the automotive industry. What I do like about it, things are, it's not the best material on the planet, but it's nicer than some of the newer cars that we're seeing. They're just, literally you look a little bit down, you see the sheet metal here, you look down, everything is well covered. At least they still care about the little details like that, and that's really good. Let's take a look at the interior of the Honda Accord. There's something to be said here. This is a very sensible interior. I mean, initially, when you look at it, it doesn't 
have much going on. But it is, I think, very simplistic and at the same time very functional. I feel like they, they focused on being conservative and functional. It's not the typical Accord interior that wows you when you enter. It's like all curves and everything. No, it's actually very conservative and that same theme you've seen on the outside you actually see it here as well it's not a bad looking interior outside is a little but i like that it's focused it's sensible it's grown up that's a word we're going to use later in the video but let's start looking at everything for example look at the steering wheel controls very very basic skip track volume a few other things cruise control nothing Nothing extremely complicated. No, it's very, very basic. The screen in the middle, for example. Even though I dislike screens usually, but it's not the largest screen in the world because you still have your fuel gauge on one side. It's not in the screen and you have your battery charge level on the other. Just kept things very simple. I love these vents. They started this, I think, in the 22 Civic. You move the vent, this mesh doesn't move, the vent is actually behind it, and it gives you always a seamless look. I really like that. It looks very classy, it looks very cool, and now it's becoming something that's defining Honda interiors lately. I love this big mechanical shifter. You don't have their normal buttons or whatnot. Well, no, it's just a good old school shifter. Nothing, no drama, nothing. They just kept things conservative and normal. And with that, there are a few things that are very interesting. Let's look at the climate control. They are rotary dials. They're really, they make a really nice sound when you turn them. Everything is physical, including your heated seats, including everything here. But the cool thing is, and this is kind of a hidden feature, if you would, the seat controls can be linked to the HVAC temperature. So you can, it's an option you can change in the menu. And when you turn on your heat, for example, you all of a sudden put it on high temperature, it'll automatically turn on the heat, the seat heaters to match that temperature. That is actually a feature you usually expect to find in an Acura, Lexus maybe, but you have it in the Accord. That is really cold. Same thing with the cooled seats if equipped. It will actually follow the temperature you set on the climate control for the seats. That is very, very cool and helpful. Now, the infotainment system, there are two infotainment systems here. There is the one for the base model and the EX, the non-hybrids, is a 7-inch. For the hybrids, they have a 12.3-inch. The one thing, this is the same system as the 22 Civic. In the 22 Civic, you had a physical button that says back and home. In the 12.3 inch screen it's actually integrated into the screen which is nice it's a pretty decent infotainment system it's not the best in the world nor is it the worst it is i think average it works pretty good it's fast a little glitchy sometimes especially with the wireless connections speaking of the connections this does have apple carplay and android auto however if you have the base model or the ex with the seven inch screen it is not wireless you have to connect it with a wire if you have the hybrids all the hybrids you have wireless apple carplay a very strange decision but that's what they ended up doing here now this car as conservative as it is, and as kind of a departure from the average Honda Accord that you used to expect, this has a drive mode select. That's pretty standard in cars, but what's not standard is individual mode. So you can customize the drive mode. I don't think many Accord owners, or at least this particular Accord generation, will be very interested in that. But you have it should you need it but right underneath that you have a very interesting button e mode and that has actually three modes that's ev mode it has three so you can put it on auto it'll automatically select if we are driving an ev or not ev and then there is ev mode which it will prioritize uh, ev driving now if you accelerate hard it's going to kick cancel it, go back to auto and we're going. And then there is charge mode. So charge mode will turn on the engine immediately and start charging the battery. However, you remember when we talked about the powertrain, it will already kind of do that as needed. But now when you put it in charge mode, it's going to prioritize that. It's going to limit some of your throttle input because it's trying to split that power, some of it to drive the traction motor, some of it to charge the battery in the back. But if you accelerate too hard, it's actually going to cancel that mode, go back to auto because now we need full 
power to go to the traction motor to drive the car. That is actually pretty cool. I don't see a real world scenario where you're going to need to put it in charge mode because this is not a plug-in hybrid. But this does give me a hint. Are they going to come out with a plug-in hybrid model? Because that feels like at a charge mode. Is a plug-in hybrid model special? And I wish they do because... The system, I would love to see it in a plug-in hybrid model because I think it'll actually be a simple transition to a plug-in hybrid. Let's take a look at the back seat of the Honda Accord. I'm 5'7", this is my driving position. There's a lot of leg room. And this has to do with this car. I feel like it has gotten bigger and this back seat shows it. Very comfortable seat. I have a lot of room, a lot of headroom. This does have a sunroof. But in this particular model that we're testing this week, it's a sport hybrid. The most controversial two words to put together. This does not have anything in the back seat. You do have a window, you do have a door, you do have a little light, and that's about it. There's no vents in the middle, there is no charging ports, nothing. When you go in the higher trims though, you do get potentially vents and charging ports, but not in the sport trim, which is a very interesting um, decision. So if you buy the sport trim, at least when you are very hot and very cold because there's no vents and your phone is dying, at least the seat is very comfortable. Let's talk about some things I do not like about the Honda Accord. And in all honesty, there is very little I do not like about this. This is a functional car. There's not much I do not like about it, but I don't love it either for the current reasons. In the looks department and in the inside, this will shock the typical Accord buyer because it is such a radical departure from the previous generations in a good way if you're a little bit on the older side, but if you're a bit on the younger side, you might not see it that way. And that may shift things for the, for the buying experience. So keep that in mind when you go look at one. The other thing is the lack of the low gear on the hybrid system. I mean, we did it in the 2023 Honda CRV. Yes, they did slightly update the ECVT in this one to make it a little bit smaller, more compact and whatnot but they still did not do the biggest thing that they did with the CRV hybrid. So I wish they would do that in the near future for this because that one is a truly cool addition to this to have the low gear and have the engine drive you at lower speeds as well, not just at higher speeds. And the last thing, and it doesn't really have to do with the car itself, it has to do with the optioning and trimming. I really dislike that there's no base model hybrid. We see this mistake done by other manufacturers, namely Toyota, I will mention that. They did some cars only in the base model and they did some cars only in the high trims and it never works well. You need to have every trim available with every possible powertrain. Maybe not the V6 if there was a V6 or a high power engine, but for a hybrid, you will have people want to buy the basic car that has none of the gizmos, just be a hybrid to get good gas mileage and enjoy this super smooth hybrid system that the Accord has. Let's talk about some things you may not have known about this particular model if you own one. So, in the models equipped with the Honda Link, where you can remote start your car from your phone and everything, in this generation, they actually added one of the coolest features I think every manufacturer should add. Normally, when you remote start a car, it's just gonna default to a certain setting of HVAC, and that's it. In the Honda Link app, you can actually adjust what do you want your climate control settings to be when you remote start your car from the app, which is a huge deal, folks. Speaking of the app, so most of these apps will have like a locator where you can see where your car is and that's it. In the Honda Accord 2023 and up, you can actually not only detect where your car is, it's actually live and it updates every three seconds. That is very important. Should the car get stolen, you can actually track it live. And the best part is, you can actually put it in stolen mode, and the next time the car is shut off, it won't restart again. It will immobilize itself, and you know exactly where it is, and you will recover it very quickly. That is actually very useful, especially if you live in an area, unfortunately, with high crime and whatnot, this is actually, this makes the app and, and the whole thing with the app actually useful for more than just remote starting the car and locking the doors and the windows. And the other thing is, we touched on this a little bit when we were talking about the exterior, but I wanted to put it in one section. 
the back glass in the hybrid bottles actually has an antenna built into it. I tried to understand what was the reasoning behind it. I could not really understand why, because the base models do have the one antenna on the roof and that's it, but you do have two antennas here, just in case. And the last thing is on the hybrid models. The battery, like we talked about it, is air-cooled. So underneath the back seat, there's actually the intake for the fan to cool the battery. You need to know the following. Never block that vent. Leave it open. Yes, if you sit a passenger in the middle of the back seat, you may partially block it, but don't, for example, put personal items or a big bag in front of it because you do need to keep that open. And the last thing is, you do need to actively use your HVAC or air conditioning in really hot days. I don't know why you wouldn't, but in case, because it'll actually use the air conditioned air inside the cabin to cool that battery and that significantly affects the life of that battery. So keep that vent clean and clear. Unfortunately, Honda, unlike Toyota, they have not been in the hybrid game for a very long time. So they don't have a filter that, that get service to make sure nothing gets in there. I hope in the future they add one. Toyota did learn from their mistakes and they added a filter much later because that was the number one cause of battery failures. But at least if you keep that vent clear and open, you will prolong the life of your hybrid battery. So should you buy the new Honda Accord? The main rival for this car has been always one, the Toyota Camry. And they both have dominated the midsize sedan sales for a very long time. And they are both truly good. But usually the Camry is more the sensible, comfortable, soft, bland car to buy. And then the Accord was always the exciting one, the one that handles better, it's a little bit more aggressive, and it looked better and everything. And you kind of had the choice between the two, it depends on your preference. Well, in this generation, the as of 2024, the Toyota Camry is a pretty good looking car. No bias there because I do actually own a Toyota Camry in 2022. However, here are the two pictures for you to see on your own eyes. The Camry definitely takes this round for looks. On the interior, the Honda Accord is very sensible, simple, no ex extravagant design or anything. It's very functional, it's very well put together, but it is very conservative. Toyota Camry, on the other hand, there's a few things that they could get away with because it's a bit much because they're trying on that aggressive side to make it more exciting and to look at. The best way I can sum it up here is things have flipped between the Camry and the Accord. The Camry now is the aggressive, exciting car and the Accord is more the mature and kind of subtle car. Do you, see, do you see where we're going about here? This, the best way to sum it up is this is a mature Honda Accord or a grown-up Honda Accord. Very different than the previous models. And on the hybrid front, and I feel like Honda is really trying to go into the hybrid game with especially this generation, comparing it again to its main brother and rival, the Toyota Camry. The Toyota Camry Hybrid, the advantage of that one is it feels more of a direct drive. You get in it, you rub it, yes, you have that drone from the CVT, but you feel the torque of the engine because it is actually driving the car. This one, that is not the case until you get to higher speeds. But on the flip side, this just feels a lot more refined if you're not trying to feel the torque of the engine. If you're just driving it normally, this will be quieter, smoother, and more refined. Again, grown up part. And this is where they are good at, one of them is good at one thing and the other one is good at the other. That's why I think they're both even in a way, but they just, they flip their roles. But the only thing I see as an issue here is with the trim, and I think this is something simply changed if they so deem necessary. You can only get the hybrid in the higher trims. You can't get it in a base model. The base model and the one just above it, they do not have hybrid options. and. When this flip happened, and now this is the more sensible and grown-up car, usually grown-up buyers will not want all the gizmos, let alone a sport model. They'll want a sensible base model that has the least amount of amenities. It is a sensible, budget-friendly mid-sized sedan. And then when you go look at the lineup, the base model is not there. 
And I think that is something that should be there because this will attract a lot more buyers being at the lower end of things and being hybrid because this hybrid system is truly refined. I mean, when you look at it from the technical standpoint, as we talked about it, it seems like it has a lot of compromises, but Honda really pulled it off. This drives very well. It behaves very nicely. It is very smooth, very refined, and that is really a huge thing. The only thing I wonder why it went this way, why does this not have the low gear like the CRV does, the 2023? That was kind of a letdown. I understand they did the CRV with that to improve its towing capacity a little bit, but still, this would have benefited from that to have that more. The engine is actually driving as well at lower speeds. Folks, I hope this video was helpful and informative. I hope you learned something new. If you like it, consider giving it a thumbs up. If you're not a subscriber, consider subscribing to the channel. Check out some of my other videos. And until the next video, folks, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And you have yourself a wonderful day.